the way it's going to go is that each of you will get an opportunity to read your poem if you would like to. And a couple of people contacted me and asked to read for someone who couldn't be here. Um, and um, a couple of people said they might be late, so they'll be at the end. And I mention that because um, I chose to do the traditional alphabetical style uh, format for an anthology. I think it's user friendly, especially when you got a lot of folks who are in the anthology. And as it unfolded, it's sort of the work sort of said, do that, because I love the way, and I invite you to discover the way that these poems, even in alphabetical order, have an amazing way of just sort of playing off each other and carrying forward. So, also, I didn't thank the guest poets. I thank them very, very much. And the family of Patrick Houck, who was a member and passed June of 2015. And they gave me permission to publish a poem of his that I fell in love with when we were in um, a workshop together a couple years ago. So what I'm going to do is say the name of each poet. I'll probably just stand up here and say it. It's in alphabetical order, so you can kind of feel your turn coming, because it's going to be a little challenge getting up and up here. And we want to get everyone a chance to read um, this evening. So without further ado, let's begin. And um, if I read the poet's name and they're not here, I'll just move along as quickly as I can. And if anything is left out or off, don't hesitate to let me know. So let's begin the evening with my copy editor, Calvin, our copy editor, Calvin Algren. How's the sound? Is there anything you can't do? We don't have that kind of time to cover it. This is called Meditation. The estuary's broad face ripples, pieces of the morning sun picked out. Things disinter and join again, rocking into view, and here, ashore, push pulled, we separate. Tutoring her nerves against the current's pull, a sculler twists tan oars on silver dapple in a silver shell. A lone pelican dressed in winter's brocade brown circles over tide's slow breath, prophet who divines the deeps. One white heron fishing with his water twin stalks through mirrored green of reeds how many days could I hunt that way? How many hours longing for the strike? Flying low and storm cloud dark, a cormorant threads the slough, teasing its hurrying shadow. Bait fish, bait fish clacks, here and there shiver the gilded surface, ideas that twitch for purchase in the great mind. Over all the mountain looms, towing us breath-bound creatures out of our reluctance, calling on us, let go. David Alpaw. Claire J. Baker. It's nice just to say the names, bring you all into the room. Eldon Beck. Michael Beebe, Judy Bertelson, Claire Blotter, great. Great. Hi. Um, before I start, I just want to plug a poetry reading coming up. Uh, this um, on Sunday at 3 o'clock at Trek Winery in Novato with uh, Tom Centilello, Kathy Evans, and Molly Giles. It's a wonderful space. We'll be out on the patio, and I hope everybody comes. I have flyers back there, too. Great. Um, my poem's called Wah Wah. They come from the book and belong to the book and were born of the book. 
We are the book, sing the words in book tongue, electric flame shooting from Holy Ghost head, where holy water spouts, holy words spout from holy water, originating in the sounds wah, wah, from Helen Keller's mouth, water flowing through her hands, pumping wah, wah, as her teacher pressed letters in her palm as if writing a book giving her speech to be born again of the sound wa of water that flowed like mana from her hand, springing from the deep sacredness of words, wa as in cry, wa as in tears, wa as in wanting these words. Thank you, Dulcie Brainerd. This is called Paled Appetites. These are the dead days, sun on its short path. Low voltage pleasures whisper to winds at the edge of the bed. We gnaw yesterday's bread meant for the swans gliding in at high tide and watch the gulls track through shoreline mud. December algae greens the swamp. Thin afternoon light sinks below the skin of ice. Under the quilt, we call up burning, water rising, the quick edge of other hungers. Barbara, Barbara Swift Brower. Good evening, uh, thank you so much for all the wonderful work you and the rest, Calvin especially, did. Um, it's a great collection. I've had a preview or two. Um, so my poem was an occasional poem. I wrote it for Doreen Stock on her birthday. Her birthday is in late January, so the poem is out of season presently, but um, it's called Swimming to Byzantium. <laughs> Like the salmon who know their season, we are swimming wildly toward our destined silver selves. Our winter new made by water's rush and thunder, accepting what flows our way. At once ignorant and certain of our direction, we are thrashing, leaping to arrive here at the source, our final and original selves. Thank you. I fell and injured myself, so I'm a little slow tonight. It's great to be here and see all your faces. My poem is called The Water Taster. I had a father who tasted water, who knew rivers, how they flowed recklessly to the bay, the Susquehanna, Juniata, Schuylkill, the Delaware, those Pennsylvania rivers from the Alleghenies, that northern Appalachian crest, like stations of the cross, purifying plants were tested constantly, not just for chemicals and safe drinking, but for clarity of taste. I'd see my father in his three-piece suit and handkerchief, cork samples from each tap along the route, and there'd be hell to pay if someone less astute than he had breached a valve or let a faucet slip. We'd visit restaurants where he would tap water glasses with a fork to let us know the water's tasting good. He knew which Philadelphia neighborhood might suffer from a chlorine taste of chemical that served to be a buffer to an algae bloom or such. There wasn't room for error, he'd declare, and many people drinking from the Schuylkill or the Delaware should thank their lucky stars that my father tested, smelled, and tasted water all those years. 
They never knew the genius of his nose and how he monitored corrected flaws in treatment plants from which their water flowed. <laughs> echo what Barbara said. Many of you I have not met, and it is so wonderful to have faces and hear the voices and the words the way you meant them, because your work really came to inhabit me. Okay, and without more comments. Yvonne Cannon. Oh, I thought I saw Excuse me. Peter Neal Carroll. Yes. Yeah. That you should uh, have your father go to Flint. Yeah. <laughs> you know, could you imagine? <clears throat> anyway, my poem is called In the Fourth Year of Trout. Soft as firewood ash, the sky wakens. A weary willow leans toward dust. Pines are vacant. Ravens notorious for morning rackets have sailed west to the coast. They know where to go. In the garden, yellowing stalks predict rising prices of lettuce. For months, I've gathered gray water to satiate the olive tree that makes no promises. Dishes sit in the sink. I crave ice cubes. I'm reminded of the Dust Bowl widow who abandoned wilted corn in Nebraska to pick fruit in California lamenting she no longer had a mailbox address. No one could find her. I'm not leaving. Just yesterday, I skipped my shower, went for a walk, returned to find someone had left a jar of sun tea brewing in the yard. Now I smell fog coming in to shroud my thirst with hope. Low clouds cozier than fire. Thank you. Eleanor Chanel. So my sonnet is Flight of Swallows, and there's an epigraph uh, from Shakespeare. Where they most breed and haunt, I have observed, the air is delicate. That's from Macbeth. Flight of Swallows. I know he is sitting up there in the dark, trying hard not to think of anything. Yet the random ripe apple he hears falling onto the sour ground remains a remark on how good things can be discarded. Last winter, he knocked their mud cup dwellings out from under the eaves Without knowing, I would leave next summer. A swallow's forked tail, no longer a talisman. The household gods lost in the rubble. Did I leave something of myself in that little room? A desk, a shelf, a chair, a window? When words failed and were tossed into balled up paper nests of poems, the heartfelt, garrulous notes of swallows filled the delicate air. Thank you. Kozrov Chantikian. Hello, everyone. I'm actually going to read. Uh, the poem in a little bigger font because of, the, <laughs> of how luminous this room is. So this, hello. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, that's good. So this poem is called After Everything Has Left. The night rain begins slowly, annulling the gravity of dreams. A few drops fall on my head as I collect the dead branches and broken leaves for tomorrow's pickup. In the morning, you were looking out the pane windows, the white and pink flowers of the camellias painted patiently by colors memory imperceptibly places in your hands. You see the thin, tall sunflower bowing slightly to greet you, asking if you would like to come closer for a better look. These are the crucial markers that reveal where you are and keeps you from being lost within yourself and in the pieces of the world that remain after you have left and disappear. That cycle of existence, even of memory lost, will continue until time itself begins to forget what it is where it began and why it dreamed it was a part of us. And the rain, whether here or not, will find a home in another part of your heart. Coming after everything else you knew, everything you hoped once you could hang onto that now has left you. Catherine Clark says, Wow, we got a passel of poets around here. Look at that, all the way back. Pont des Art is falling down. Under the weight of lovers' locks, a panel has collapsed and been replaced, and already locks begin to reappear. Enormous locks to close cathedral doors, locks of brass fit for guarding jewels in a carved and fragrant cedar box. Dainty locks to keep diary secrets safe. Less costly than a wedding ring, a ritual of lovers to scratch their names, clasp the lock to a railing of the bridge, pledge forever love, and throw the key into the seine. Locks by the thousands on the Pont de l'Archevêche and the bridges all around the world. And on, every, on the river beds, a growing crust of keys, a puzzle for archaeologists in a thousand years. Like the modern rivers where turn up hundreds of broken ancient swords so that we must make stories of sacrifice to warrior gods, assume great battles lost. Imagine theories for a hundred thousand keys, something about a cult of expectations, something involving prisoners released. <laughs> Pat Crawford. Sandra Cross. There are a lot of you. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, everybody. Um, this is called Water of Love. Your river could be a strong brown god, conveyor of commerce rushing past the sun. My river pools in hard-to-see rooms, dark underwatery walls of hanging brown leaves, a cool green flow hidden by whatever grows out of the bottom. Algae confuses the surface. You see my water sitting still, reflecting. I am what you wish I would be. I am underwater. You are five white petals and small yellow spears bending over the pond in the woods, fighting a light breeze. My river runs underground through caverns that echo, in, that echo the chant of water dripping into pools, underground waterfalls thundering far off, filigree ferns erupting from cracks in the stone, rustlings in the brush, sounds of someone lost. 
Yet your tides draw me. Do you talk to the moon too? I want to be sunlight, dancing with the scent of redwoods, weaving shadows and stillness on your glistening surface. Lucille Lang Day. Hi. Oops. Um, this is called Flood in Venice. The hotel clerk handed us ugly boots that came to our knees before we went outside, where green water from the canals poured over the streets. It was high tide and raining, a routine flood. By afternoon, the water would recede leaving behind plastic bags and scraps of soggy cardboard. But as I slogged through narrow streets looking in shop windows for Murano glass jewelry, I thought of Hurricane Katrina, the bloated bodies in New Orleans, and the earthquake that hit Indonesia, how the sea was sucked out all the way to the horizon then rose 100 feet and rushed forward with biblical force. I knew the sun would be back the next day in Venice to do its sparkly dance around the gondolas. But as I paid for necklaces with multicolored beads shimmering like foil, I thought of Noah and the Titanic. Water as a wild card a jaded god was holding and might play. <laughs> Rafaela del Borgo. Robert Eastwood. We have a guest reader, Kathleen. Robert Eastwood isn't able to be here tonight, and I'm honored to read on his behalf. Robert's poem is called Immersion. Once I floated, immersed in warm aqueous jelly. Currents held me plumb in this liquid world. So when I walk into the seducing sea, which envelops my vulnerable skin with the hunger of a lover, smoothly, ardently, at once lifting and pressing, as if I step through translucence, as in a movie, where an entrance, a gelatinous window, translates the entrant to a different idiom. I feel, as immersion grows, an enticing, yet fearful, return. Then, as depth and press increase, and lap of the surface rises to my neck, then to my chin, and I feel my toes lift from the touch of solid sand, I have a palpable awareness. I am not made for a liquid world. And if I sink below the surface, I will die. Yet I am at once lightened and can shove against the sea's salty aspic, repel the constant pull and pressure. So I move with the sea into a marvel of its unremitting peristalsis, its wash against gradient, shore and sea, its devouring earthen grip. Thank you. Donna L. Emerson, Linda Enders. The Soul Again. Odd, isn't it? that the soul wants to go on and on. The body says, wait, slow down, stop a while. 
The soul runs on ahead, dances up the path, flies up into the clouds, slides down the waterfall into the quiet pool, and climbs out to do it all over again and again and again. The soul will not be contained in a frail body. This is where the idea of eternal life comes from. The body rehearses to avoid the final call while the soul listens for the bell to ring. Gail Intrican, Ella Aitan, is that correct? Close, Aitan. Aitan. Thank you. Boy, we are a huge crowd all the way to the back. It's wonderful to be here. My poem is called Renoir at 75. He paints by the Riviera because moist sea air illuminates the space between things. His models trail scarves of lapis and amber, their alabaster skin blurred at the edges into blue and violet. Parasols of lemon and jade, pistachio and persimmon follow in loops and arcs as they spin. He takes it all in, his brush recording motion and stillness, a curve here, a slash of darkness to move it forward. Then they tie his brush to his arthritic hands, find models to inspire him, and he paints drunk on sun and breeze, color and the lush opulence of flesh, unobtainable now, except with his brush. <laughs> Laurel Feigenbaum. Thank you. It's nice to be here once again after a while. Let's see, I'm on the next page. This is called the Weather Report. Drapes open this morning to sun after days and nights of cold gray rain, life in motion again. Walkers back on the path, children's voices, dogs, bikes, a mockingbird ventures forth, surveys from the fence. Finches dart from acacia to makeshift bird bath, vying for puddled space. The bower vine that suffered water freeze in gr is green with energy to climb, not so the bougainvillea. We needed rain, all but danced for it. Feel guilty if we complain, but oh, the sun. <laughs> Stephen Galliani, Terry Glass, The Pond. Now, this is a place that's outside of Eugene, Oregon. It sits right in front of my sister's house. The pond. The pond is motionless, held under a widespread layer of scum. The pond looks frozen. The pond is not really a pond, but a section of a lake where a beaver with olive-sized nostrils lives. A small creek feeds into the pond, but you would never know it. The pond is motionless, held under a widespread layer of scum. The beaver has built a dam on the small creek with twigs and branches, and one wooden plank it stole from a construction site. The beaver is elusive in the emotionless pond, held under a widespread layer of scum. An unseen bird sings a monotonous tune in a tree above the pond. The note drifts in the air, deadened by the humidity of summer. A small breeze lifts the leaves of the trees, any minute, the beaver could appear, breaking up the scum and breathing through its wide nostrils. Meanwhile, the pond is still, still as a sheet of glass. Mm -hmm. 
Grace Marie Grafton, Carol Griffin, Okay, I'm one of those way in the back. <laughs> Hearing a poem in Persian. We settle in with ears all wide and hear the words like water over falls, cascades of cadence, rivers rush and glide, carried as if on waves beyond the walls. The lyric sounds in sense seem something wise, the weight of water, breath, a taste of fire. Like tumbled stones, the lower tones arise and flow directly to the heart's desire. And as I listen in, it isn't only the lilting rune, but the leaning into you, a flannel warmth and comfort like the poem coming home, yet somehow deeper, too. And all of this a momentary grace, as time leaves just a sparkling trace. And Joyce Griffin? Is Joyce here? Susan Gunter. Catlin, thank you so much for this lovely anthology. Thank you, Calvin, and everyone involved. Off Route 6 in winter, between Tonopah and Ely, a black-tailed jackrabbit bounces across the rutted clay track. Tadpoles swim in a cloudy rain puddle. Our feet sink into gray mud as we step past spent red shells and sun-bleached cans, past glinting shards of arrowheads, past prickly pear. Small sounds draw us into this great basin, this salt-encrusted desert. Up shallow inclines, beyond barbed fences, we find marshes, even a lake, where distant snowy peaks float like pointillist ice cream cones. We reach a sanctuary, ducks and ducks, more ducks, mallards, mergansers, canvasbacks, congregating in pools. They quack like feathered spin doctors, their throats engines of noise. Then they see us or hear us. The mergansers spook and climb to the skies. Hundreds of wings turn the air, swatches of black and white silk rubbing, a sifting of feathers and currents like water flowing over round stones. They bank, turn again and again in the sky's kaleidoscope, with us marveling at their patterns and silent in wonder. Thank you. Like certain painters who take a palette into the museum and retouch paintings already hung, <laughs> I find I'm dissatisfied with a few worst word choices and I reserve the right to change them as I go along. <laughs> Ocean acidification. We knew no shore was lasting but the sea. They tell us now the ocean that we thought imperturbable, that was our lazy symbol for what lasts and what we shall not know. The sea that we thought vast and clueless, mad and true, killer to us at times but never killed. 
The sea has had a change of ions. Now it will eat coral. It will permit no creature, soft-bodied, edible, to execute a shell. The minds of chemicals can change, their feeding habits alter. And we have taught them, pouring in our sad prescriptions, doing what we do. We have reset the valences. We have replaced with our vernacular the Latin of the sea, with irony, the frankness of the wave. The man now dead and floating like a gut among the slops and shinings of the sea, was he the one you sent your message, message by? Then that too is dissolved and glimmering. Unspeaking, walk by the acoustic sea, the blue burn and the changing, the molecules urgent in the tide, the waters shaken and unsatisfied. Thank you. I love the way poets are always working. And our work is never done. True Heights. Um, thank you to everybody. I'm sitting right here in the front, and it is such a pleasure to be hearing people I've heard read all over the years, and I can remember some of the poems they've read before, and my face is really close, and it's really feels good to be here and to have all this be happening. Thank you very much. Okay. So this my poem is called Spring Break at Thatcher School. And for those of you who don't know, Thatcher School is a prep school where most of the students are from the East Coast. And they come to get their education. The outside of a horse is good for the inside of a boy. And uh, then they leave in the summertime. So I live right next to that. Our home was right next to that, the school. Okay. Spring break at Thatcher School. The horses come galloping out of the hills when they hear the sound of the truck bringing water. Crowded around it, pushing each other, nipping, kicking, ears back, eyes rolling, restless as the water streamed into a trough until it was deep enough to plunge their muzzles in. Nostrils dilated, whiskers trembling. They suck long rivers of water up into their dusty throats. <laughs> Marvin R. Hamstra. Suzanne Himmelwright. Oh, is Marvin here? No, you're here. Okay. Suzanne. No, no, no. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for your contribution, Mark. My. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Inspiration. At dawn near Notre Dame, where gargoyles stand watch, my friend shops at a boulangerie in goose feather bed, espresso, and croissants. Among the crumbs, she writes poetry. In half a year, 12 perfect poems, outside the hush of her garret, rain splashed chimney pots, church bells chiming. Here, I sip tea brewed in a pot of California crockery. Outside, waves slap the shore. The garden glows color. On antique oak, my empty notebook. Perhaps I need a change of scene, saunter along the Seine in spring. At the Bois de Boulogne, meander through Cezanne greens, the trees whispering phrases of Fleur de Mont. At a sidewalk cafe, a glass of Bordeaux, a chat with Rimbaud, a poem a day. Or instead of foreign lands, at home, see hummingbirds' ruby's head dip into coreopsis, sun gold. Let words soar on pelican wings, 
Dive into the teal black lagoon. Leave a trail of silver rings. Many thanks to Jane Hirschfield, one of our guest poets, who was so sweet and so enthusiastic and just thinks the world of the Marin Poetry Center. And uh, David Holt. Uh, one small thing. I dropped a syllable from my name, and then I go by Dave. 100% of the time, no exceptions, except when my mother talks to me. <laughs> Straddling the high beams of Anderson Bridge. Looking into the moral chasm, I escaped drugs, drinking, and nights of cruelty. Staring down into murky water, Run, river, run past the damage done. With you, Rob, my too easygoing friend, eaten alive by the emptiness, someone had to cut your wasted body down, devoured by the void while I escaped. Got away by following my angels, just as I'd done since childhood, out of trash-filled alleyways, where one forgotten flower bloomed. Partnering with someone, Rob, loving, being loved, that's what saved me from the end of the rope. I walked through this abyss with you, remember? You dared me to cross over the unfinished bridge across Oakville's river, to walk the concrete beams and steel bars, looking down between our feet from that height to fast water below. Nothing between us and the moving current but our nerve and our quick beating hearts. I'd be afraid to do it now. Back then, we were practicing courage. I used it to break away from there, but you, who dared me traverse the half-completed span, you didn't make the crossing. Jody L. Hattel. I've been sitting back there and, and realizing that everybody's looking at their copy of the anthology. I'd like to invite you just to listen if you want, or if you want to read along, you can. Winter flood. The muddy creek roils and rushes past. Standing safe on the bank above, I watch as 20-foot logs hurtle by. This morning's downpour caused this turbulent swell. The sodden earth can hold no more, releases the debris, loose soil, dead limbs, decaying leaves, even an old tire passes in churning haste. By gulps and gouges, the greedy water gnaws some ground away. Each fall I prepare to battle winter storms, buttress my bank, fortify it against a winter flood. In spring, I will once again gaze upon clear, untroubled waters, gladdened to see returning steelhead spawn in still, small pools, watch the drowsy, black-backed turtles warm themselves on stones, and in the heat of the day, I will also bask in the sun, knowing that for one more year I've held my ground. <laughs> 